You know, um, the promises of God are amazing, and they should be amazing, and they should be big. And we have to learn to think big and expect big and believe big, because our Father has resources that we don't have, and he has them. And Jesus said to, to us in Scripture, do not fret, little ones, because it is your Father's great pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, we don't have to come uh, shy or with intimidation or fear to ask and to expect from him because it makes him happy. It gives him good pleasure. It's his idea to give it all to us, to give it to us. You see, and that's when we have to come, the mindsets of inheritance to know we're sons and daughters. And we can come and ask, and he will give us big things because he's big. You know, he gives according to his resources, not to our resources. And that's the exciting part. It makes him happy to do it. It gives him great pleasure to do it. So we can enjoy it. He's our father. And it makes him happy, so we can make him happy. Um, You know, when God speaks and we respond to his promises. There are things we need to do, of course. And I'm not going to go through all of it because of time. I'm just going to summarize the whole conference tonight. I know. We will have to get the tape. But um, one of the, there's, in the scripture, just like with everything, God is a, fa- is a father, and there are conditions to many things he says. And we are normal children, we want God to give us things and do things for us, but we don't like the conditions. We miss them most of the time. You know, we just want him to do it. But the conditions are always very important when God gives one. We have to pay attention. And the people of Israel lived through that when God gave them the great promise of their destiny and inheritance, freedom and the promised land. And you know the story. I'm not going to read it. You know, in the book of Numbers, when they went to spy the land and the whole thing. And then when they came back with the reports and the whole story, then they were debating whether to believe or not, remember? Because of circumstances. And they were debating. And there was the ones, you know, who said no, and the two who said yes, because God said so, even though the circumstances, they're bad. But... You know, those those two sides are still very active within us today. And they pull in different directions. We have, you know, the side that looks at circumstances, agrees with them, and freaks out. And then there is a side within us that believes God. And tonight, I want to help you separate them to be able to make choices. Because we have to make be people of choices. The people of God are so afraid of making decisions. It isn't funny. And the lack of decision making is keeping people stuck, wandering around in the wilderness, walking in circles around the mountains. We need to make, learn to make decisions. We have to stop being afraid of making decisions. And that's why we have to be very mindful of God's word. When he speaks, we have to listen. We don't have a culture like that. We say we do, but we don't. The truth is, God speaks, and about 20 minutes later, we forgot what he said. And he, I mean, we are in church. We, by the time we are in the parking lot, we have, if somebody wants to know what the sermon was about, we have to think. And hopefully remember a bit of it. Because we don't have that culture. We don't have the importance of God's word within us. Jesus said, Matthew 4, 4, For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. Every word, imagine. Every word that comes out of God's mouth. And... um, I think your husband is looking for you. 
<laughs> and and we have to be mindful that is very important you know he the we man does not live of bread alone but of every word that comes out of God's mouth we have to develop a culture in our lives and our hearts to honor what God says, every word that comes out of his mouth, everything he says, you know, is better than food, is better than life. And we have to learn to honor it, to honor his voice, to honor his words, and be good stewards of his words. Now, stewardship is very important. It moves heaven. And when God speaks, we have a responsibility to be stewards of that word, it amazes me to have people come for more prophetic words all the time around the world. The approach to the prophetic is very interesting because most people see the prophetic as to what is God going to give me? What am I going to get? What is next for me? What is he going to do for me? And when you have that approach, bless you, when you have that approach, there is sent usually abundance because that is the wrong reason to approach prophecy because if that is the, re- the approach to prophecy that you have, what is God going to give me? Give me more. I want more. I want more. What is next? What is going to do next? Next or give me next? 90% of the time, you will not do anything with that prophecy because it's all about what I'm going to get. But per- prophecy is not about what you're going to get. The proper View of prophecy is we come to the Lord to get to know him better. Through prophecy, we get to know his heart better. We get to know his ways better, his mind better. And it is to come and find out, not what he is going to give me next, what does he want me to do for him next? You see, it's coming to say, here I am. I have done what you asked me to do. What else would you like? I'm available. You see, we have to be good stewards. Collecting prophecies is a waste of time. You know, and it doesn't amount to anything. We need to learn to be mindful of his word. The scripture says that God's word is a lamp unto our feet. And it will show us the direction, show us the way God's word in the scripture, but his word is prophecy from the Father's heart is his word. And it is a lamp to our feet. We need to be mindful of it. We need to pay attention. We need to know our prophecies like this because when we have to make decisions, we need to know what God has said. Instead of sitting there and saying, what do I do next? I need direction. Where do I go? And you know, three quarters of the time, what you want to know is in the prophecies you already received. But because we don't have that mindset of stewardship, you know, of treasuring God's words, like Jesus said, you know, we don't live of bread alone, but of every word that comes out of his mouth. Ivan and I do not struggle making decisions, and we make, deci- we make decisions all the time, big things and little things, and all the time things come, we don't struggle because we know our prophetic words, we know the Road map to our destiny. We know, you know, how to understand prophecies. You know, and in our book we teach you how to dissect your prophecies so you can make a road map to your de- prophetic destiny. It is very easy. And I want to say, you know, our book is out there for sale somewhere. But, and it teaches you what to do with your prophecies when you go home. However, if there is somebody who cannot afford the book, just go and get one. You know, because we want you to get the keys and the tools. So if you can't afford it, be blessed with the book. But, you know, the thing is, we, when we have to make decisions, we just look at the situation and say, does it align with our prophetic words? If we do this, will it take us? Will it? Along the side, we'll go with it, or will it take us in a different direction to where our prophetic words are taking us? If the answer is no, then we don't do it. It's not, 
It's not a problem. We don't do it. Because we have a prophetic destiny. The Father God has spoken. We know the direction he's taking us. So we make decisions accordingly. It's not a big deal. But for that, we have to remember what God has said. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. We recently received a mail from a, a minister somewhere around the world and said, you know, we are in a season of transition and uh, uh, we need direction from the Lord. We're seeking clear direction. So we want you guys, you and, uh, both of you, to pray for us and we want to meet with you and see if the Lord uh, gives us some clear direction. We know we are in the need, need to step in something else. And on and on. And I read the email. I love the people very much. And for some odd reason, I happen to remember a portion of the last time we prophesied over them about six years ago. And the prophecy said, there's a change in a shift. I mean, the prophecy was about 20 minutes, but the portion I remember. There's a change of seasons and a shift that's going to come for you. And there is church planting next. For you, prepare for church plant, prepare to birth a new ministry that is coming for you. It will start with planting a church and it will spread beyond a church into a big ministry. They will house others' ministries underneath and so on. So as I remember that, I thought, you know, why would I give them another prophecy? If they had been mindful of that prophecy six years ago, they would have already the inquiring of the Lord, where should we do this? How to do it? And they will have things ready and they will be walking into it. But they forgot about it. And now they want another prophecy. They know what God wants them to do. So I can listen to a message back and send. The answer you're looking for is in our last prophecy. Listen to it and you will know the direction you need to go. You know, and they replied back and said, yes, we just remembered direction being there, we will take, we will listen to it and do something about it. They could have been ready. Instead of now finding themselves in, what do we do next? They could have been ready and advancing. You see, we need to be mindful of every word that comes out of his mouth. They're important. It's alive. In Numbers 14, they were debating whether to believe or not. And um, Joshua and Caleb arose, and they said something very, very, very important. And they gave three conditions that, to enter into the promised land. Three very important things. That, uh, you know, to receive our inheritance. And we do our part, and we answer, and we prepare, and we do our portion to get ready for what God has said, when then there comes a part when then God empowers and releases. And... Uh, when he responds. And in verse 8 and 9, we find three powerful conditions. And I have discovered that they are still important today. And they are still big today. If we are mindful of these conditions. In verse 8, in verse 7, they spoke to the people and said, the land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land, if the Lord is pleased with us. That's the first condition. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into the land, and he will give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey, if the Lord is pleased with us. That if is huge. If he's pleased with us. If he's not pleased with us, then he's not going to do it. Period. It is very important. We have to develop a lifestyle and a culture of pleasing God. Every day of pleasing him, making the most important thing in our life to please God. You see, if the Lord is pleased with us, verse 9 only, second condition, do not rebel against the Lord. You know, rebelling against the Lord is not good. Rebelling, that's what the people of Israel did. Rebelling against the Lord was as simple as not believing Him. 
You see, that's rebelling against the Lord. He doesn't like it. He doesn't please him. He doesn't please me. Well, my daughter doesn't believe me. Trust me. She gets into trouble. You know, she gets grounded. She thinks, I'm terrible. I told her one day, this is nothing, honey. When the people of Israel didn't believe God, they got grounded for 40 years. <laughs> Be grateful, it's just a weekend. <laughs> you know, do not rebel against the Lord. Rebelling against the Lord, it's as simple as not believing Him, questioning Him, challenging Him, arguing with Him, and disagreeing with Him. That's all part of rebelling. Against God. So that's the second condition. Only do not rebel against him. Don't do it. You see? Very important. A third condition. And do not fear, do not fear the people of the land. And do not fear the circumstances that oppose you. The things that make it look impossible. Do not fear the people of the land. For their protection has been removed from them. And they will be our prey. You know, I love that, that scripture, that promise. Their protection has been removed from them and they will be our prey. Do not fear the people of the land. It is very important. It is a bigger than big, huger than huge. Not to fear anything. It's very important because fear is a manner of submission and worship. When you fear something, you become slave to what you fear. When you fear something, you give your thoughts to that situation. You give your attention to that situation. You focus on that situation and you start worshiping it by Making it the center of your attention, the center of your, the center of your thoughts. And only God should have that place. Do not fear is a manner of worship. When you fear someone or something, they rule over you. Whether it is a person, a situation, uh, anything. Any kind of fear will rule over you, will control you. That's very important that we don't fear anything. That's why the promises of God are so important to us. Because the moment God gives you a promise, the protection of the giants is removed from them. And you have the guarantee they will be your prey. They will be our prey. So do not fear them, for God is with us. Do not fear them. Do not fear the circumstances that tell you it's not possible. Do not fear that a long time ago Ivan has an uh, eye condition. And the doctor said he will go blind. He's almost blind on his left eye. But they said he will go completely blind a long time ago. You know, and then we have a promise of have destiny. And then suddenly blindness arises like a mighty giant in front of us. And there it is staring at us, you know. And so first you feel, oh no, your stomach turns into eyes and into a knot. And oh my goodness, you know, like she was saying today, that was beautiful. Thank you. And, uh, you know, then one day somebody was praying for us and they got a word from the Lord and said to Ivan, Ivan, the Lord is, said, it said he's going to heal your eyes. Now this person didn't know the fullness of the situation but, and what we were facing. We said, the, Lord, the Lord's going to heal your eyes. At that moment, blindness became our prey. Because the protection of blindness was removed from it. God gave us a promise that he will heal his eyes. Blindness is not going to overtake us. We will overtake it. From that moment on, the tables turned and we faced blindness as our prey. Because God said, so we have a promise, we have a guarantee. And we are not going to fear the giants of the land, the inhabitants of the land. Because we have a promise from God that removes the protection from it and guarantees there will be our prey because the Lord is with us, not with him. It's with us. And you know, then two more prophecies came about, came about the healing of Ivan's eyes. And 
We don't fear blindness at all. We welcome the healing of his eyes every day. I lay hands on him and I bless them. And I bless the healing. And I say to the Lord any day, every day, today is a good day for the miracles. We welcome the miracles as a good day today. We live expecting the fullness of the miracle. We don't ex- live expecting the threat of blindness. We expect the miracle. We live expecting it. And against all medical odds, four years ago, his eyes began to revert. The doctor said it is impossible. It is documented. His eyes, his condition is impossible. And now, for three years in a row, they have weakened his prescription a tiny bit each time. You see? The giants are trembling. And the giant is falling. You see? But it's a matter of decisions. We have to make these decisions. In these situations, we have to make decisions. We cannot just be there going by what we feel, by what's happening. See the difference between these two spies, the the two sides of the ten and the two, was the decisions they made. Ten made the decision to look at the circumstances. Two made the decision to believe God in spite of the circumstances. It is a matter of decisions, people. And we have to become people of decisions. People, when God has spoken, we need to start acting. Faith without actions is dead. If you believe God, then we walk in that direction. We change directions. We start walking in that direction that God said, if we believe him. You see, we don't just sit there to say, one of the things that drives me crazy is hearing people say, well, I'm waiting for God to tell me the next step. But if God has already given you the destination, get moving. Common sense, people. Common sense. The church is allergic to it, but we can get rid of the allergy. Common sense. Well, pastors will live longer if we exercise common sense. Proverbs says, do not neglect common sense and discernment. So common sense, if God said, go here, get going and start making decisions. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Of course you're going to make them. But God is greater than our mistakes. And he will correct us and he will help us. He will align us. He will change us. He will, as long as we want the destination with all our hearts, he will make sure we make it. But we need to get moving. You see, don't be so passive. You know, that nothing happens. Don't be like Canadians. I God bless them. They're wonderful. But, you know, cultures are a funny thing. I, I know four cultures quite well. You know, I lo- know Latin American culture, Canadian culture, American culture, and British culture. And, you know, Latin American culture, Latin Americans are very passionate in everything. We do everything 300%. There's nothing halfway. It is... We're upset. We're upset with passion. We're happy. We're happy with passion. We put passion into everything that we do. You know, um, Americans are a nation of leaders. And you lead, and you go through, and you do. You know, and uh, it is, you know, a powerful thing to be a nation of leaders. And you forge the way and you make decisions. Leaders, Americans are not afraid of making decisions or even making mistakes. It's a nation of leaders. British are a nation of conquerors. And let me tell you, I know, there she is. And the British are a nation of conquerors. And I love you, honey. But let me tell you, they are stubborn. I'm married to one. Let me tell you, trying to prove, I love them with passion, I love Britain, but trying to prove them wrong, you better be well prepared before you try to tell a Brit they are wrong in something, because, you know, Ivan always tells me, honey, our motto is to make the world Britain. (laughs) You know, we conquer. (laughs) And uh, Canadians, on the other hand, are peacemakers. They invented peacekeepers, peacekeeping around the world, and they are a nation of peacemakers. Let me tell you, 
There is no nation in the world more laid back than Canadians. You know, there is nothing worse. And you have to be a foreigner to appreciate this. There is nothing worse than being in Canada in a four-way stop with all the bases loaded. You don't want to find yourself in that situation. You can sit all four cars there for 20 minutes going like this. No, no, you, you, you go first. No, no, you go first. No, no, you go first. And nobody moves. And that moment you wish there was an American in one of those cars that would push the gas and do something. You know? Because, you know, and it is fascinating when you see how different nationalities and countries, you know, are, and that influences our walk with the Lord tremendously. But remember, we talked this afternoon about a new land, our new country, our new culture, and the culture of the kingdom, people in the kingdom, people take the kingdom by force. You see, we are active, we respond, we arise, we we are like Caleb and Joshua. That is the character we need to develop. We need to take the kingdom by force. We have to stop being American or Canadian or Latin American or whatever else, or, or British, you know, or anything else. We need to become kingdom people. You see, it is different, like these guys were. So we need to learn to please God. If God is pleased with us, the most important thing, if you want your promises... If you want God's blessings, if you want everything in your lives, is to become people who live to please God. To live a life that pleases Him. To make the decision. See, if you want to do this, we need to do it. It's not if we want to, we have to. There is no choice here. We have to. You have to make a big monumental decision. The chief decision of all is... Will you live your life to please God every single day, to live every day of your life? That the main purpose of your day, of the main thing you do, is to please your Father and to make Him smile. You know, it's to live to make Him smile. That yes, you will make decisions, uh, you will make mistakes along the way, but in areas in which you can choose, you choose to please him and make him smile. Even if you don't like it. If he likes it, it is fine. If he smiles, it is fine. Even if you don't like it. But if he likes it. You see, that's the most important thing that we have to do in life. Is to live to please him and to make him smile. That every night when we go to bed and we say good night to the father, there's a smile on his face. Because in the choices that you made that day, you chose to make him smile, to please him. Not to please yourself, but to please him. Not to please others, but to please him. You see, and when we make that decision to please God above all things, we become people who live by the Spirit and not by the soul. Because the Ten, the twelve spies within us, the two sides that we are dealing with, are the spirit and the soul. They pull in different directions. Galatians says that they are at war within us, the spirit and the soul. And we have to learn the difference. We have to be people who learn to live by the spirit, not by the soul. And living by the Spirit is very simple. It is not about having to be fasting, you know, 10 days a month and praying 23 hours a day and sleeping for 15 minutes and keep on that. That would be really boring, you know. So it's not about that, to live in this religious heavy yoke. But living by the Spirit and the soul is very easy. People who live by the soul are people who live according to their feelings and their emotions. The soul is the spirit, is the mind, will, and emotions. People who live by their soul take the cues by what they feel, make decisions based on what they feel. And 
that is a huge problem. Because the soul is fickle. The soul is up and down all day long. The soul changes constantly because the soul is circumstantial. The soul is a wonderful thing. We need it. It's very important. But we have to learn to harness our soul. If you don't learn to harness your soul, you will never walk in your destiny. You will never, ever advance into your promised land. And you will always walk in circles. People who live by their soul are double-minded and unstable in all their ways. They are like a roller coaster, up and down, up and down. One moment they're happy, one moment now they're down. You know, you wake up in the morning and everything is good, coffee is ready, and, uh, you know, the bread is ready, and your husband cleaned the house, and everything is wonderful before you get up in the morning. And uh, everything is good, circumstances are good, your soul is happy, God is good, hallelujah, the faithfulness of God is wonderful. Until you look at the window and somebody killed your cat. Somebody ran over your cat. Then your soul goes down. Then God isn't faithful anymore. God isn't good anymore. You go down in the pit. <coughs> you look out the window and somebody let it slash your tire. Or stole your newspaper. And your soul goes down. And then what's, everything is wrong. God is not as good anymore. Why didn't he protect my newspaper? You know, he knows I need my newspaper. You know, and then the neighbor comes and gives you his newspaper. And all of a sudden your soul is up again. God is faithful again. God is good again. You see, that's the soul. Living by the soul is like that. The soul responds to circumstances and makes decisions based on circumstances. And people who do that are not reliable because they can't stick it out. People who live by their soul struggle in their marriage tremendously because they go by emotions. But what they feel? Because they think, oh, she doesn't look as beautiful anymore. Or she just said that or he did that and Oh, I felt like this and I feel like that. Oh, yeah, now I don't feel, don't like him anymore today, you know, and then, uh, and then a lot of divorces happen because of that. People living by the soul. Because we live in a society that caters to the soul. Living by the soul means satisfying your desires, your present desires at the moment, whatever it takes to feel good. What makes you feel good? You pursue that, you live by the soul, whatever makes you feel good. Problem with the soul is it is never satisfied and it's always looking for something else. So people who live by the soul end up in addictions because you are looking for something to make you feel good. People who live by the soul leave church all the time because, well, I don't like the songs they sing anymore. It doesn't do it for me. Oh, well, you know, the pastor hugged so-and-so, but he didn't hug me today. Well, so I got a cold cup of coffee, but everyone else got a nice coffee. You know, and you go by what you feel. You see, that's your soul. People trade their destiny and their inheritance all the time because of that. It's so dead it. In Genesis 25, Esau lost his destiny, his inheritance, to satisfy an immediate present need. You see, because this is what he needed now, and he lost sight of the rest and regretted it later. So we have to be careful because your soul will always be demanding. The soul is very, very loud. It pokes and pokes and pokes and pokes and pokes and says, give me, do it, do it, do it, do it. People who live by their soul have lots of issues of pride and attitudes. Lots of attitudes. You know, and that is a big problem. Because attitudes are not good. You see, I don't have time for attitudes. And as a pastor in my church, I don't have time for attitudes. I will not waste one second. I have been a Christian, trained Christian counselor for 30 years. I love inner healing. I love counseling. I love all of that. But I will not waste a minute of my life 
dealing with somebody because of an attitude. I send them to deal with their attitude first, and then I will help them with the root, the issue in their lives that caused the attitude to arise. But I don't have time for attitude. We have in our church an imaginary t-shirt that we pass around to everybody, and it is the suck it up shirt. <laughs> and everybody knows about the suck it up t-shirt. You know, and very often, you know, on Facebook, I get notes from the kids in my church. Mom, do you know who has the shirt so-and-so is needing it today? <laughs> you know, I went there, I was really whining about something, just getting an attitude about something. And very nicely, one of them said, yes, yes, I know, but you know, I think it's time for you to wear the shirt now for a while. You know, very nicely realized, okay, I have developed an attitude, I'll deal with it. And you know, it works for us. We just pass around the shirt and it works. People realize I have an attitude, let's deal with the attitudes. Because that is all behaviors of the soul that we have to learn to deal with. You see, but people who live by the soul are constantly getting attitudes and are constantly, you know, dissatisfied. In, in their ways and the way things are and all of that, they're always complaining. But you see, it is that up and down of the soul. And because it is so demanding, it wants it now. And our society teaches it to play, to, to do it. Do whatever it takes. Get another loan and buy more shoes. You know, and then get the next thing and drink more and drugs, alcohol, whatever it takes. All those things are to feel good. You know, all those addictions, all those things are because the soul, the needs of the soul. People who live by their soul. Now, living by the spirit is different. Living by the spirit is living by decisions that please God. Living by decisions. The soul is self-focused. The spirit is God-focused. The soul seeks its own pleasure and satisfaction the spirit seeks God to please God. It's focused in God. So when to live by the spirit, we just have to learn to live by the deci- making decisions that please God. What makes him happy? And when you make that decision, I will live my life to please my father and make him smile every single day of my life. Every other decision that you have to make throughout the day, gets filtered through that one. If I do this, will my father smile? That's all you have to ask. Take two minutes and say, this is what I feel like doing, but if I do this, will my father smile? It's that easy it is to learn to live by the soul or the spirit. You see, it's not complicated. Will he smile if I do this? If I yell at my husband, tell him what I feel right now, it will make me feel good right now. It will, my, will it make my father smile if I tell these things to his son? You know, if I make my wife cry, will my father smile? People who live by the soul react. People who live by the spirit respond. There's a big difference between reacting and responding. You see, and if you learn to just make decisions that please God, you will become a person who, who learns to respond. And it is not difficult. It's decisions. And you know what? You are going to hate it. Because it will kill your flesh. That's what it means, dying to self and killing your flesh. That's what it looks like, to kill your flesh. You feel like doing something, you know, saying something, but you stop to ask God, will you smile if I do this? You know, and then you make the choice, I'm not going to do it because I want him to smile. And you feel your flesh dying and your soul screaming inside of you. You see, that's how we die to self, people. But you know what happens when we make these decisions? The moment you make the decision to do what pleases the Father and makes him smile, 
the Holy Spirit responds to empower you to do it. You don't have to do it on your own because the Holy Spirit will empower you. If you want to live an empowered life by the Holy Spirit, learn to live pleasing God. And you will see power. You will see breakthroughs. You will see deliverance. Your wife may be in bed sleeping. Your children may be in bed. You have a hidden laptop somewhere in the shed that nobody knows you have. And you know, nobody will know if you go out to watch one of those bad sites. You know, everybody's asleep. Nobody knows. But if you take just a minute and say, if I do this, will my father smile? Let me tell you, you will walk away from sinful situations and you will walk into freedom because the Holy Spirit will empower you to walk out of those bad habits and bad behaviors and bad ways of the soul and the sinful nature will die. You see, and perhaps you will need to go for some inner healing and some freedom and some help. Of course, God, we need to help our soul. We don't just ignore it. If we need help, we, if it is an attitude, we deal with it. If it is actually, you have an awe in your soul, but there's in the healing. There's people who pray, will pray for you. Go talk to somebody and get prayer. Ivan and I do it all the time. You see, but we just need to live by decision, not by what we feel. You see, because it, your feelings will betray you all the time and will lead you the wrong way. That's what it means, you know. The, man, the ways of a man seem right in his own eyes by the end. You see, because that your feelings will never lead you the right way. So we need to learn to harness our soul like David did. It's very easy. And the thing is, the choice is yours. The soul or the spirit, they're both tagging inside of you. The choice is yours. See, I have a teenage daughter. I have plenty of opportunities to live by the soul. Trust me. One day she said to me, Mom, I'm going to go to church. And I'm going to tell them what you really are like. They think you are so nice. You smile and hug everybody. Well, let me, I'm going to go and tell them how you just yelled at me. And they'll find out. And I said, honey, knock yourself out. <laughs> because there is no jury in this world that will condemn the mother of a teenage PMSing daughter for yelling at her once in a while, you know. And let me tell you, decisions work. The proof that choosing to please the father in my household, the proof of it is the kid is still alive. If I did not live to make him smile, there are days when I tell Jesus, open the door because she may come today. It's getting close, trust me. But I have had, you know, I just stand there. One day I sent her to clean her room. And I went to check on her progress. She said, Mom, you know that story of Cinderella and the wickedest stepmother that made her work and work and work and she couldn't have any fun? But that's my life around here, you know. But my soul I re responded. I tell you, my soul arose inside of me. And I was about to say, really? Because I can give you Cinderella for 24 hours. I can make this happen. I'll give you a taste of Cinderella. And you will know how good you have it after that. And I was about to say it when the husband stepped in. And I like it when he steps in and tells her, respect your mother, blah, blah, blah. You know, I like that. I appreciate that. Not that day. <laughs> that day, I could taste vengeance in my tongue. You know, I, I, I knew. 24 hours is all I took. it took. It would have carried me through the rest of her adolescence. You know, I would have savored that, those 24 hours of vengeance, you know. And he dealt with the situation, and then he looked at me and said, you will thank me later. <laughs> it took me three days to forgive him. You know, my soul arose now in the other direction. You know, because... He took away my 
vengeance, you know, because my soul wanted vengeance at that moment. I needed it, you know. And it was true, it's true, you know. I realized later by the third day, you know, yes, of course, you know, if I had done that 24 hours in, I would have had to uh, repent later and apologize, and that's even worse, you know. So, you know, I did thank him later, you know, but anyway... You know, life is life, and it works that way. And we have choices all day long. Who are we going to please? And the fruit of that will carry us later, you see? And so it is easy. One time I was said, temptation is the result of this. You know, and we had to make decisions. One time I was... Um, because we travel so much, we, I go through a lot of luggage and handbags and so on. And this one time, I needed to buy a new purse, or a, a big bag, a handbag. So I only had so much money to buy it. So I went to the shop in the mall where they sold them. And I looked at them, you know, the ones within my price range, and they were not that nice, you know. But on the other side of the shop, there was a purple bag. Had an aura on it. And angels were fanning it, you know, and rainbows were coming underneath and on the sides. It was the most glorious thing I had ever seen in my life. And I was looking at it, you know, and it was $10 more than I had. It wasn't a lot, but that day I didn't have the extra money. That was, I had my budget, that was my limit, that was my limit, you know. That was $10 more, and I thought, you know, well, you know. Oh, well, I have to buy the ugly purse, you know. But before buying the ugly purse, I went to another shop to buy something I needed for the house. And when I paid, as I was walking, about to walk out the door, I looked, and the cashier had made a mistake and gave me 10 extra dollars. I had 10 extra dollars in my hand, you know, that the cashier gave me. She gave it to me. I didn't ask for it, you know. And I'm looking at this $10 just by the door. My soul said, as loud as can be, it could have been heard by the, at the Eiffel Tower. My soul screamed within me, the Lord provided. <laughs> See, it even spoke my language. Knows my lingo, the Lord provided. Now we can get the purse we want. My soul said, give me my purse. You know? And my spirit, very gently, said inside of me, you could do that, but do you think it will make your father smile? My soul heard that and shouted, Oh, shut up. (laughs) You can repent later. (laughs) I know. Scary, isn't it? You can repent later. And my spirit didn't say a thing, but I could feel the press. I could feel him. He asked the wrong, the right question, but it was the wrong question for my soul, you know. Because I have already made the decision, I will live to make him smile. I want to put a smile on his face because I know what it's like to go to bed and say goodnight and see a tear in his eye because I couldn't have chosen to please him, but instead I chose to please myself. And I wounded him and I hurt him. You know, and I don't like to go to sleep like that. It's not worth it. And I stood there with, you know, the war inside of me, soul and spirit push, pulling in different directions. The soul was shouting, you know, and the spirit was gentle, focused on God. And I had a choice to make, and common sense kind of kicked in because I figured, you know, as much as I like the purple one, I don't think I'm going to enjoy it because every time I look at it, I will know, yeah, he didn't like, he didn't smile. Plus, I know, yes, I could do that and repent later, but that is abusing grace, and that does not make him happy either. That will not make him smile at all, you know? So I thought, oh, well, you know, bite the bullet. Do the right thing. I went back and gave her the $10 and said, you know, 
You made a mistake. She was thrilled. Oh my goodness, I can't believe you are like people like you don't exist today, you know. You are so honest. You are so amazing. Thank you so much. I can't believe. Oh my goodness, she was singing praises to me and you know, bowing down. And I'm watching him half yeah, yeah. I'm thinking to myself as she's telling me all these things, honey, if you had heard my internal dialogue by the door, you wouldn't be this impressed. It's you got your money back only because I want to make him smile. And my soul wanted to steal it from you. You see, it happens every day. These things are life and we get, and that's how we get into a lot of trouble. But when we have our decisions made already, then it becomes easier. So I went by, got the ugly purse, didn't like it, didn't enjoy it. It served its purpose, but every time I looked at it, I knew he smiled. It was the choice that made him smile. And that was better than a purple purse. You see, we get to choose every day. When you live by the spirit or the soul, people who live by the soul, you know, the soul is always going to scream. The soul is always going to react. The soul is never going to, hardly ever like what God tells you to do. Hardly ever. You see? And, but we have to learn to make decisions. People who live by the soul, very seldom are people of faith. Because they go by what they feel. And faith is not based on what you feel. You see, many times when God speaks, my soul freaks out inside of me. And I just say to my dear soul, I know, I know you don't like this, but go down and have a nap. Because I'm going to please God. And you will be all right at the end. I promise at the end you'll be fine. You know? Thank God for David. See, the soul stirs within us all the time under circumstances when you have to pay the price, when you have to make choices. You know, your soul will stir. A troubled soul is a normal thing. Jesus had a troubled soul. He had to deal with it. A troubled soul. The problem is a lot of people confuse a troubled soul with lack of peace. And there's... There are two very different things. A troubled soul and a lack of peace are not the same thing. You know, Jesus, like I said, had to deal with it when he said, Father, if you could take this cup from me, but then he made a choice. But your will will be done. He chose God to please God at that moment because his soul was stirring within him and was troubled within him. His soul was probably screaming and telling him, don't do this to me. Said that he sweat, you know, he had blood come out of his pores. You know, that's extreme stress when that happens. His soul was very troubled, but he made the choice to please God. You see, we all go through that. We just have to learn, understand this is normal, and learn to harness our soul. Don't let our soul control us, but we can have control of our soul. You know, King David taught us about this. So, you know, I have a friend, they are pastors, and um, they have been waiting for their breakthrough to their destiny, fulfillment of promises, and on and on and on, for a long time. And finally it happened, and they were offered to pastor a church in the west coast of Canada. And it was thrilling, we were excited, finally, thank you, Lord, it was time. One day she contacted me and said, Isabel, I don't think... We can do this. I don't think this is from God because I don't have peace. And I thought, okay, I knew it was from God, but you know, it is hard decision to not mind. She's the one living it. So she has to know for herself. And I said, oh, okay, well, tell me what is happening. Describe to me your lack of peace. What's happening that you don't have peace? She said, well, you know, if we go, you know, our children are finally settled and they finally made friends here because they came from another country for originally. And, you know, they are fine now and they are happy. They are settled in good schools. They can now, you know, do this. And 
They're growing and it is wonderful. The church we are in has embraced our vision for evangelism and we have developed this evangelistic ministry. The people are coming to the Lord, getting saved constantly. If we move, you know what's going to happen to this. And we finally, you know, got the house, got the promised stars, and, you know, we just renovated. It's perfect. It's, and, you know, over there, life is more expensive. If we sell the house, we will not have a good a good house like this there, we can't afford it, and the salary they are offering us is not going to cover all our expenses. And she went through a whole list of things. And when she finished, I said to her, dear, what you are describing to me is a troubled soul, not like a peace. Your soul is troubled because of the decision and the change and what it would be like. I said, I know it is your soul stirring within you because everything you are telling me is circumstantial. If you were telling me, well, you know, this is the situation and told me, you know, this about the children and the house and this and that, but it will be challenging, it will be difficult, but we will, at the end it will work out. Somehow we know we'll, we will work out, but it has, I don't, you know, have peace in my spirit. And it's not focused on circumstances. Then I will pay attention, I will know, okay, there's no, there's really no peace. So we need to inquire of the Lord as to why there's no peace. What is the, the warning? What is the warning about? But it was, was all circumstantial. So we talked at length about her spirit, the soul, and how to separate them. She was dealing with her feelings and emotions that were stirred and troubled within her. When, then we prayed together. And then when her soul settled, I said to her, because she con- when she contacted me, she said, I am praying and praying and praying up a storm, and I- God is not answering. I can't hear him. That's why I'm calling you. And the problem is, when your soul is stirred within you, you cannot hear God. He can be shouting. You cannot hear him, because you will get stressed. And stress, when your soul is troubled, you get stressed. And the stress puts up walls immediately and closes your spirit. So when your soul is troubled, don't even bother trying to hear God. You can't. You won't. When your soul is troubled, do not make decisions either. Because the decisions that you make when your soul stirs are usually not the decisions that God has for you. But they are the decisions that will settle your soul immediately. And a lot of people have lost their inheritance and God's plans and purposes because of that. We have to learn to discern between our spirit and our soul. It's very important. So, when finally her soul calmed down, I said to her, okay, now tell me, in any of your prophetic words, do you have any prophecies that talk about anything like this, possibly like this, like moving like this and that aligns with this opportunity offered to you. Do you have any prophecy, anything that can align, that will align accordingly? And she stopped, there was silence for a few minutes, two, a couple of minutes, and then she said, oh my goodness, I just heard it. She said, I just heard in the recesses of my brain, my mind, I just heard Ivan's voice when he prophesied over us three years ago. He prophesied and he said, the Lord is going to move you to the west coast of Canada. And she said, I know exactly where the type is. And it's right there. God is moving you and your ministry is going to open up for you in the west coast of Canada. And all of a sudden she went from being completely a mess to excitement. Her, and now her spirit arose. And the Holy Spirit responded. You see? And they went, and everything worked out better than they had expected. The children didn't have a problem with anything. God gave them a great house. Everything worked out. All her fears, nothing as she expected happened, you know, but her soul. She, they almost lost their inheritance because of her troubled soul. You see, confusing it with lack of peace. Soul, people, our soul is a problem. So we have to learn. Scripture says in Proverbs 16, 15, when the king smiles, there is life. 
His favor refreshes like a spring rain. When the king smiles, when we please him and he smiles, favor comes upon you. Every time you make a decision that puts a smile on his face, favor will come upon you. And life will come upon you. You see, that's how easy it is. I mean, it's not easy. You will hate it, but it's worth it. You know. But you get used to it after a while. My soul just now says, oh, no, not again. No, my soul knows I'm not listening. Proverbs 16, verse 7 says, When the ways of a man are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You have troubles in your life? Please God, and you will see them going away. He will take care of them. He will even make your enemies to be at peace with you. When your ways please him. You want warfare? That is the most powerful warfare. Please God. If your ways please him, he takes care of your enemies. He will take care of your financial trouble and make it right. He will deal with your health issues. He will deal with the family problems. He will deal with the circumstances. He will deal with the depressions. He will deal with the torments. He will deal with your enemies. And he will make them be at peace with you. That's ultimate breakthrough. Ultimate victory. You see? You can spend your life fighting the circumstances and fighting demons all you want. Or you can please God and let him take care of it for you. I learned the second one is easier. I did the first one for a long time. I almost got an ulcer and got burned out trying to be so spiritual. Now I let him take care of it, you know. And life is so much easier. You see, when you live by faith, when you live by the Spirit, faith becomes easier. When you live by the soul, you will struggle with faith all the time. Faith is a very important thing. Scripture says in Hebrews that it, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we are in the business of pleasing God. So, you know, it's important to know this. Without faith, we cannot please him. So we have to have faith because we have to please him. We want to please him and blah, blah, blah. You you have to. So now we have to do this pleasing God. Faith is spiritual. In Hebrews 4, 2 says, For indeed, they also heard the words or the news that were spoken to us. They heard it just as we did. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in the hearts of those who heard it. You see, for the words that God speaks to you for his promises and for his prophecies in your lives to bring fruit and to work, you have to receive them with faith. It has to be, your heart has to have faith. It has to be mixed with faith. Hearing it is not enough, but you have to have faith. The problem is that most of the church is trying to have faith through the soul, based on the soul, and that is not faith. That is a migraine headache. You know, a lot of people are trying and are struggling. The church struggles tremendously because of lack of faith. And the reason for this is our approach to faith is earthly. And we have, a, as we said this afternoon, we cannot approach heavenly things with earthly mindsets. Earthly approach doesn't work for heavenly things. Faith is one of those things. Somehow somebody that wanted to be really smart at some point in life came up with the idea that we have to produce faith, that we have to come up with faith, and we have to somehow squeeze it out of the back teeth, that we have to have faith, and we have to get faith, you know, and all these things. And the church, everybody, is trying, striving and struggling, trying to have faith, and we all fail at it. And the problem is, then we go back to what we were talking this afternoon, this elitism thing that this one was more special. He has more faith than I do. What's wrong with me? Why can't I have faith? Why can't I believe God? Why can't I have faith to believe God? 
Because the thing is, you do not need any faith to believe God. And I'm going to prove that in a minute. We don't have, as far as I am concerned, faith is a supernatural thing. You can disagree with me if you want. Knock yourself out. However, try this for three months and tell me if it doesn't work. Uh, remember, his yoke is easy and his burden is very light. And here's the thing. For me, faith is supernatural. There is nothing natural, normal in believing in something you cannot see. It doesn't make sense. It's upside down. It's craziness to the mind. You know what scripture says. Faith is not normal in our earthly makeup. We are not supernatural. Faith is a supernatural thing. We are not supernatural. I am not supernatural. My father is supernatural, but I am not supernatural. So why am I trying to produce something I can't produce? That's why we struggle so much. That's why there is so much guilt in the church and so much condemnation because of lack of faith. And I hear people saying, and I used to do this many years ago, I'm trying to have faith to believe God, but I'm struggling. Yesterday I had enough faith to believe him, but today I don't have enough faith. I'm trying to get faith to believe God, but I keep failing. The thing is, people, that you do not need any faith to believe God at all. Guaranteed. Because believing God is a decision that you have to make. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. You don't be, we don't believe according to what we feel. We believe because he said it. We make a choice. Believing God is a decision that you have to make. You see? And the amazing thing is, when you make the decision to believe God, it pleases God, the Holy Spirit responds and gives you the faith to carry you through. Faith is the byproduct of believing God. Not the other way around. You have to believe to have faith. But you do not need faith to believe God at all. But you need to believe God. Scripture in James, James 2, Scripture does not say, for Abraham had so much faith that he became a righteous man and also a friend of God. He was counted as friend of God because he had so much faith. It doesn't say that. It says, for Abraham believed God. And because of that, he became righteous and was counted as a friend of God. He believed God. He became a father of faith because he believed God. He kept on believing. Now, there's, there's people, there are some people in the world, my husband is one of them, they have a supernatural gift of faith and it's really scary for the rest of mortals like me. You know, but he has this gift of faith. God speaks. He goes to buy build church buildings and to do things with not a nickel in his pocket. And he has a hundred thousand dollars cash from God within a week and a half. You know, and things like this. And God speaks, and the man acts, and God comes through every single time. I have learned not to freak out anymore. But you know, it used to be really scary. You know, John Arnold is like that, and you know, he mentored him and taught him, and it's. They are different. We are not talking about them. We're talking about the rest of us who grow in faith through life. You see, the rest of us who are not so special as those people. And now, no, the rest of us, you know, they have, that's a supernatural gift of faith. I admire it, but it's quite scary sometimes. You know, but the rest of us, scripture says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, for faith is having the confidence that what you hope for will actually come to pass. Well, it's actually going to happen. It's having the assurance of the things you cannot see. And, you know, I realized that there is a step before faith comes. Something is offered to you. Because if it is having the assurance, it's having the confidence that what you hope for is going to happen. That means something, there has been a transaction before for you to hope for something. 
Something has been offered to you. You see, faith, to believe God, you don't need faith. God speaks, you choose to believe. We believe people based on the degree of trust we have in them. We trust people based on the on how well we know them. That's why faith is how trust in God is difficult in the church. Because a lot of people are more of an acquaintance level with God in the personal knowledge of Him, personal relationship, and the walking with Him and knowing His character. So, but the more better we know somebody, if somebody who is an acquaintance offers you a trip to Hawaii in the summer, it's nice, you get excited, but you take it with a grain of salt. You want evidence of it. You don't take the time of work until they give you the money for the ticket. You know, they pay for the ticket. They give you the ticket, then you go shopping. You get your swimsuit and get ready because now you have proof evidence of it. But if someone who is a real good friend, someone you know personally, you know the heart, and you trust that person offers you that trip to Hawaii, you don't need any evidence of it. You believe it. And you go immediately and take the week of work without having the tickets in your hand because you know that they mean it and they will do it. And that's the level, the problem with trusting God. You know, if you are in an acquaintance level with God, you need proofs, confirmations, ten signs, and all kinds of things before you believe Him. You know, but if you know Him and trust Him, His word is sufficient. You see? So, believing God is a matter of choice. We choose to believe him. The Holy Spirit then does the rest. He empowers us and gives us the faith because heaven is filled with faith and we can get as much as we need and as much as we want for everything. When you all got saved... You did not have faith for your salvation, for eternity and heaven before you heard the message of salvation. Somebody somehow presented to you the message of the cross. You didn't have faith for it. You heard the message of the cross somehow, and you had a choice to make believe it or not. It wasn't a matter of having faith for it. It was a matter of believing it. And when you made the choice to believe it, the Holy Spirit responded and gave you the assurance of your salvation. It arose within you the confidence that your sins are forgiven, that Jesus paid for you and you're going to heaven, that you can die now and you're going straight to the to heaven with God. You didn't have that before you chose to believe. That was the, res- the byproduct of believing. You see, that's how faith works. We choose and heaven responds to give you the faith. However, there is the dealings with our soul through the process of faith. And we all deal with our soul, of course. So, you know, remember that guy in the Bible who said to Jesus, I believe and help my unbelief. I believe and help me not to doubt. Okay, that guy, you know, and this is what happens. And belief and doubt happen in the soul. So, we all deal with this. This is what faith is like. And this is what growing in faith and walking in faith is like. There you are. And it is, you know, seven in the morning. And the Lord gives you a promise. The Lord speaks. You receive, let's say, a a prophecy that says God is going to do something. And, or you... Or he personally tells you. But you get a promise from God that is exciting. He's going to heal you. He's going to use you. He's going to bring, you know, your dog back. You know, he ran away three days ago, but he promised to bring it back. Whatever promise he has given you, you get a promise, and immediately you feel excited, and you feel encouraged. Because God is going to do it, and everything is really good until 7.15. You know, at 7.15, your soul freaks out, your soul reacts and looks at the circumstances, but the dog is not coming anywhere, nothing is happening, the pain is still here, look at my bank account, there's still no money, and we need this and we need that, but, you know, and all of a sudden, 
So you all of a sudden, you know, your doubt arises in your soul because of the circumstances. Most of the time, you sit there and you start beating yourself up. Why don't I have enough faith? What's wrong with me? Why did I lose my faith? I had faith 15 minutes ago, and I just lost all my faith. But, you know, and you start feeling condemned because you just lost your faith. You know, it was that fast, and it is all gone. The thing is, you haven't lost anything. All that means is you only had enough faith to carry you for 15 minutes. That's all that means. You only had 15 minutes worth of faith. What is better than nothing? And this is very normal because we're dealing with the spirit and the soul. So all you have to do, don't go into beating yourself up. Don't listen to the accuser. Don't go into guilt and condemnation. What's wrong with me? Why can't I believe God? Relax. This is normal. All you have to do, it simply means you run out of faith because you only have 15 minutes worth of faith. So all you have to do is go get more. All you have to do is Choose to believe again at 7.15. You see, you tell your soul, I know your trouble, I know what the circumstances look like, but I have a promise from God and I'm going to believe it. And at 7.15, at 7.15, you say, Lord, my soul is troubled within me. However, I choose to believe that you said you are going to do this. I choose to believe it, that you will do it. At that moment, the Holy Spirit comes and gives you another shot of faith. And your soul comes down again, and you are good, and everything is good until 7.30, when it all arises again. Because remember, you only have enough faith to carry you for 15 minutes. So, at 7.30... You choose to believe all over again. Don't be disappointed. Don't be angry. Don't be frustrated. It's normal. You are dealing with the unbelief of the soul, the freakouts of the soul. So you tell your soul again at 730, I know, I know, but it will be fine because God promised me this. And you say, Lord, I choose to believe that you are going to heal me. I choose to believe that my goldfish is coming back to life. I choose to believe that you will provide for, you will pay my debts, like you said, or you're going to do this, that you said, I choose to believe the promise you gave me again. Your soul, the Holy Spirit responds, your soul comes down till 7.45. You see? And it goes like that. All you have to do is keep on believing each time you run out of faith. That's all. Every time your soul stirs, You go for more faith. It may take you days. It may take you weeks, believing every 15 minutes, until suddenly one day you realize that you can go for a whole half an hour between freakouts. You know, you have half an hour. You know what that means? Your faith has doubled. You went from 15 minutes worth of faith to 30 minutes worth of faith. That's huge. That's worth a party. You now have 30 minutes of faith to carry you for half an hour. So you keep believing God every half an hour again. And then all of a sudden you realize you can go for two hours. Now that's exciting. From 15 minutes to two hours worth of faith. And then, you know, it may take six months, and suddenly you realize you can go for a whole half a day without needing a paper bag to breathe in. You know? That means faith has grown in you now enough to carry you for a whole. You can now sleep at night. You know, you have enough faith to carry you. And, you know, that's how easy it is to become giants of faith. One step at a time, believing God, one step at a time. Understanding the workings of the soul and not beating yourself up because you're soul, but learning to harness your soul. 
the faithfulness of God will always, always, always manifest. And your soul at the end will always say, thank you for believing. Thank you for trusting. Thank you for not listening to me. At the end, your soul will be very happy. I guarantee you, even though the process will kill it. The process will not be pleasing to the soul, but it will be pleasing to the Lord. And when he smiles, you will be happy. I have grown in faith so much that I don't freak out as much now when God speaks, but it has been years. I'll be living every 15 minutes. And there are some things I have faith to carry me for a good portion of the day. Right of the start, in some areas, in other areas, I don't. So everything is different because every situation is different. Every situation pulls different strings in your soul and in your heart. That's all. But we just keep on believing God and choosing to believe God. And I'm going to finish with a story I like very much. Some of you have heard it, and since I have the mic, you will hear it again. And you may, and you may never see me again. So hang in there for a few more minutes. When Ivan and I got married, it was a complete work of faith like that. I have lived this to the fullness, more than you can imagine. When Ivan and I met, we kind of hated each other. Ivan was a Christian hippie. He was a hippie, a Christian hippie, but he was a hippie. He had long, bushy hair, a long, bushy beard, one earring, and long toenails. You have no idea. On his behalf, I have to tell you, he has asked me to tell you, he was a clean hippie. He showered every day and he did not stink. I was in a church back home that was no offense to anybody at all. This was my reality. It was Amish slash Pentecostal slash Brethren slash Shepherding. That is as bad as it gets. The mix is not a good mix. So, we, it was control on asteroids. Let me tell you, you have no idea the levels of control we lived under and everything. It was serious, serious control beyond anything I can explain to you. So we lived, everything was uh, the appearance of holiness. We had to look very godly. And I had to wear a doily on my head. And we couldn't even shave our legs because that was sinful and we would go to hell if we didn't. And ladies, see, Stephanie hasn't heard this. I could braid my legs. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. But I was holy. And <laughs> so there I was with this, you know, legalism galore. Legalism, up. there was, you have no idea the levels of legalism we had and I had. And there was Ivan who lived with John and Carol Arnold, who was preaching on the Father's love and the Father's heart. This sounded like peace and love to me. Long toenails, bushy hair, peace, no good. So I condemned, I condemned the guy as a heathen, and I told everybody, do not talk to that man because he's a heathen. There is no way a Christian, a real man who knows God, can look like that. You know, he's a sinful man, he's a heathen, and if you talk to that man, when the judgment of God falls, he's going to kill you. Because God is going to whack that guy for being a deceiver, and for being a heathen among God's people. And I would not even talk to the guy, despised him, because, you know, he was a heathen. And, you know, when Ivan is looking at us and saying, get me out of here, please, look at these people. And he didn't want anything to do with us either. God bless him. You know, so up he went, he left, and we were not even friends because I would not be friends with that, somebody like that. There was no way. He was going to hell, and I was going to heaven. So, so two, about two years went by. We were not friends. And I didn't, when there wasn't... We didn't want to be friends. I didn't even know what had happened to the guy, and I didn't care. 
you know, two years went by and thereabouts, and one day there is this brain wave, a brain wave in heaven, you know, and makes everything shake. And the Lord spoke to me in a dream. He spoke in a dream and said, Isabel, I want you to marry Ivan. I know. I know. Said, I want you to marry Ivan. Said, and if you marry, I have planned a destiny for the two of you together. I have called your lives together for my kingdom and for my glory. I want you to marry him for me. If you marry Ivan, I will use you together to build my kingdom throughout the nations of the earth. And I will use your marriage for your, for my glory and my name. If you are willing to do this for me, I will give you a gift of love that will join you forever. Let me tell you, if I, if you needed faith to believe God, I wouldn't be here. Because I couldn't see that coming. I had no faith for that at all. The first thing I thought was, if I marry him, I have to kiss him and I gagged. And let me tell you, I had no faith whatsoever, so don't tell me you need faith to believe God. And I said to the Lord, for you, I will do anything. It doesn't matter what you ask of me, I will do it for you. If this is what you require from me, I will do it. Yes, I'll marry Ivan for you. Yes, I will go with him and I will build your kingdom for the rest of my life with him. I give you my promise and my word. Please do whatever you have to do to make it happen. And I promise I will marry him for you. At that moment, the Holy Spirit responded, and the confidence arose within me that it would be fine. And that what God said would come about. The Lord began to work and brought Ivan to Costa Rica. And Ivan didn't know he was going to marry me at all. He would have never come because he wasn't going. Trust me, he would have never come. And he came to set up an outreach for John and Carol. And um, the second night that he was in Costa Rica, he was praying at night before going to bed, and he asked God the, uh, the wrong question. It was just his fault. He asked the really wrong question. He said to the Lord, well, I know what I came to do, and um, but I'm going to be here for two full weeks, and it isn't going to take two weeks to do what I came to do. Is there anything else you want me to do while I'm here? <clears throat> At that moment, the presence of God came into the room, and the Lord spoke to him audibly and said, Yes, Ivan, the reason why I brought you here is because I want you to marry Isabel. And Ivan rebuked the devil. I bet you were feeling bad that I didn't want to kiss him. He rebuked the devil. And he did it for a whole 20 minutes. Finally, the Lord said to him, Ivan, it's not him, it's me. You know, I want you to marry Isabel, will you marry her for me? Ivan, being the British man he is, argued with God for six hours that night, trying to get out of it. He used every possible argument under the sun as to why it was not a good idea, and he worked as hard as he could to get out of it. The Lord kindly listened for the whole time and finally said to him, Ivan, I am not interested in any of those things. All I want to know is, will you do this for me or not? And Ivan gave God the exact same answer I gave him. For you, I will do anything. I would even marry that woman for you. <laughs> and uh, he went to sleep. And the next day, um, Ivan had to go to a meeting with some people for youth, a youth for Christ, and I knew some English, and he asked me 
to translate. He hired me to translate for him and has not paid me yet. <laughs> and uh, so I went, we were, anyway, I went to translate for him and late about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, an angel came to talk to Ivan. I saw the angel appear in a physical form. I saw him appear, uh, saw him disappear when he came to talk to Ivan. And the angel came to confirm to Ivan the conversation that he had with God the night before, that he was to marry me between you and me. I know God sent the angel because he was afraid Ivan would wake up and think it was a nightmare and just forget the whole thing, you know. He took an angel to make sure it happened. And the angel also came to give him the time for the engagement when it was to happen, because it was an event for God and for the plans of heaven. And according to the plans of heaven and what God was going to do, the engagement was to happen immediately. So, within an hour of the angel's visitation, Ivan and I shook hands on an engagement. (laughs) We did not like each other. We did not, were not attracted to each other. We did not want to marry each other. But we have both given God a promise, separately, that we will marry him. That we will marry each other for him and his kingdom. Let me tell you, when I get to heaven, we have a lunch arranged with Isaac and Rebecca. We have to swap the stories. <laughs> I, have to, I have to talk to Rebecca and say, well, what was it for you? Because this is how it was for me when God told me, you know. So anyway, we got engaged, and it was an exciting moment. Just obedience to the Lord and his plans and his kingdom and the destiny God had for us. And within an hour of getting engaged, um, I then went with my pastor to the mountains for a three-day ministry trip. It had been prearranged. During the three days, he was on the, in the mountains with my pastor. The Lord fulfilled the promise in the dream and gave us a supernatural gift of love for each other. When Ivan came back from the mountains and we saw each other, which was the next time we saw each other after the handshake, we loved each other as if we had been together forever. We never fell in love with each other. We were supernaturally in love with each other. <laughs> Everybody said it wouldn't work. Everybody said God doesn't do that. It was so out of the box and so flaky. It wasn't funny. But thank God for Isaac and Rebecca. That was the only reference. Because it happened with Isaac. There was precedent in the Bible. God did it with Isaac and Rebecca. My pastor agreed to let, to let, to let us get married. And anyway, and um, we have been married for almost 24 years. And since the day we got married until now, we have been living everything God said he would do. Everything God said has come to pass. Everything. We have seen God bend over backwards, go out of his way to help us. We are very happy together, except when we are mad at each other. But it's you know, that's usually heaven's fault. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, no. You know, we have seen the faithfulness of God and everything he said, he would do his done. And you know, since the day we got married till today, I love kissing Ivan. (laughs) I know. And uh, you know, that is as big as a miracle, as big as creation. I gagged at the thought. (laughs) Now, it is like a compulsion. I can't be around him and I kiss him. You know, and uh, I can tell you from experience, that is the second biggest decision of my whole life. First, to meet Jesus, to walk with the Lord, to follow Jesus. Secondly, marriage. And it is the best thing we have ever done. If time went back, we would do it all over again. We are very happy together. We are very in love with each other. And we love doing what we do. You know, and living the destiny God planned for the two of us, for his glory and his kingdom. I've never looked back, but I've never regretted it. 
But we didn't have faith for it. We chose to believe God. And it worked. Let's stand. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your kindness. And Father, I thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And Father, I thank you that you are a provider and you provide everything we need to do to make you happy. That you are not a cruel God that demands and doesn't give us what we need. You know our limitations. And you know that we can't do it on our own. But you send your Holy Spirit to do it for us and in us. And Father, as we stand here together, we want to be people who believe you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I just want to break off those heavy yokes that have been on many of you, a performance of striving for God's approval, of striving for God's presence, of striving for his kingdom, of striving for miracles of a striving for our inheritance because inheritance is not to be earned as a gift to be received and Jesus paid for it is the right of sonship to enjoy our inheritance and in the name of Jesus we want to receive our inheritance We want to receive your kingdom because it makes you happy to give it to us. It is your great delight to give it to us. So, Father, we want to come to you with a different approach from with the approach of sons and daughters, with the approach of inheritance. And Father, we just want to give up all the striving, all the sense of unworthiness, all the sense of inferiority, all guilt that we have carried for not being good enough, for not doing good enough, and just accept the reality, the fact that you like us, you like us already, you love us already. And we don't need to impress you. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just break off all that performance, all the heaviness that has been in the hearts of many. And I just release you, in the name of Jesus, from all of it from those mindsets of having to do it somebody else's way. And I just bless you to be free to be yourself, to be real, to be who God created you to be, and to enjoy His kingdom, His presence and inheritance in the name of Jesus. And Father, together we just say, we want to live a life to live our lives to please you and to make you smile. We want to make you smile with every decision of our lives, with everything we do. And Father, today we choose to believe you. We want to be people who believe God in everything that when you speak, we believe. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we repent for the many times when we thought that you were 
it was so difficult to please you. It was so difficult to have faith. It was so difficult to do all these things. And right now, we choose to be simple like children. Father, would you help us be simple and grow in simplicity each day, in simplicity every time you speak. We choose to be childlike and leave the complicated things to you to figure out. So in the name of Jesus, right now, with the authority that has been given to me, I release an impartation for inheritance and destiny. And right now, I call forth every single promise God has given you. And I call forth every single prophetic word that has been spoken over your lives. Even the ones you forgot, the ones you dismissed, the ones you didn't believe, the ones that you didn't know what to do with them, so you just left them. So in the name of Jesus, I recall everything back because destiny is redeemable and inheritance is not lost. So in the name of Jesus, I bless everyone and I bless New Day and this church as well with the destiny God planned for you. I call forth and I bless every word God has spoken over you. Everyone, since the day of your creation in your mother's womb, until today, I bless everything to call back to life, to come back to life in Jesus' name. Everything. And dear Holy Spirit, would you bring back the things that are forgotten, they are written in the spirit of man. Would you bring them back to the memory? To the knowledge, to the awareness of each person so they can make decisions accordingly. So Father, we thank you that you have made it possible for us. And in the name of Jesus, I release an impartation for faith to arise. I bless you to be men and women of faith. I bless you to be men and women who walk alongside Abraham and Moses. I bless you to be men and women who will swap stories with them in heaven. Men and women that will come and tell Abraham and Moses, let me tell you what he did after you left. Let me tell you the stories of what happened after you left. Of what I saw him do. What I walked with him. What he did in my day. So in the name of Jesus right now, I bless you to be mindful of his presence and his heart. And dear Holy Spirit, would you be so kind as to give each person the portion that they need, the impartation that they need for to believe, to walk it through. In the name of Jesus, for the transition for the transforming, the renewing of the mind, for the journey of the renewing of the mind. And just like that man said to Jesus that day, I believe, but help me not to doubt. We stand before you and say, we believe, but help us not to doubt. And when a believer rises in the soul, would you help us make the decisions so the Spirit can arise? In the name of Jesus, I just bless you to arise. And I speak right now into your very DNA in the name of Jesus, and I call it to life. I call to life right now every word, everything I deposited within your DNA and I speak in, a, in the name of Jesus to awaken right now and to arise. I speak to your spirits, to your spirits to arise, to arise and take over in the name of Jesus to arise.
because we choose to live by the Spirit, to be people who know how to discern the works of the Spirit and the soul. So, Father, in Jesus' name right now, I release freedom right now, freedom to choose and freedom to be in every person here. Freedom to choose and freedom to be. And I call you forth and I bless you to be everything God planned for you, everything He said, every single thing that God has dreamt about you, that it will manifest. In the name of Jesus, I bless you to be people of a strength. I bless you with the strength instead of weakness. I bless you with life instead of death. I bless you with joy and not sadness. I bless you to rejoice even if sorrow knocks on the door. I bless you with peace instead of trouble. I bless, I bless you to conquer. I bless you to stand on the mountains, on the mountain tops. And I bless you to conquer and to overcome in every area of your lives. I bless you to be overcomers. I bless you to prosper in all things. I bless you with prosperity instead of poverty. In the name of Jesus. I bless you to be the head and not the tail in everything God has said and in everything that you do. May you walk in the favor of God for His love and His presence are unconditional. They will never go away and they will never diminish and His favor will increase or decrease according to your choices. May you learn to live in favor every day of your lives. May you be people who make the king smile. So as your ways are pleasing to him, may you be people who live in peace, whose enemies are defeated by him, with ultimate victory in the land of man. I bless you to be all God created you to be, And I bless you to possess the land God has for you. For I have seen that land. And it is a good land that will close with milk and honey. I have tasted the land. I have tasted the honey. The fruit of the land is good. And yes, there are giants in the land. But if the Lord your God is pleased with you, He will take you in and give it to you. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they will be your prey. The protection has been removed from them. Do not be afraid for God is with you and he will give it to you. I bless you with the spirit of the conqueror I bless you to receive an impartation of the spirit of the conqueror right now. And I bless new day to arise as a conqueror in the land. In the name of Jesus. I bless you with the spirit of the conqueror that was in David. I bless you with the spirit of the conqueror that was in Jesus. Right now, in Jesus' name, I bless you with the spirit of the conqueror. May you learn to think like a conqueror thinks. May you learn to live as a conqueror lives. Not pursue, not being pursued, but pursuing your enemies. With peace and rest, with life. In the name of Jesus, I bless you with fullness of inheritance. And with authority that has been given to me in the name of Jesus, 
I declare and decree a shift to take place in the heavenly realm. And I speak a shift to take place in the atmosphere right now. Over every person here, over every ministry here, over this church, over a new day, in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare a shift to take place immediately in Jesus' name. Right now for inheritance to come through. For the sons and daughters to receive the inheritance right now in the name of Jesus. And every hindrance, every obstacle has to move a shift to take place immediately for the breakthroughs and the release of inheritance. And in the name of Jesus, I bless this, this church with a deposit of impartation and blessing as well for having hosted us here. May you give them another portion, an extra portion for their kindness to us in the name of Jesus. And I just bless you to arise. And to become part of the family business. To partake of the family business in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It's day of in- the day of inheritance and the day of release. I just heard trumpets blowing in heaven for release and advancement. So I bless you with release and advancement in Jesus' name. Release and advancement to come in the name of Jesus right now. I want to ask you, I believe in the impartation by the laying on of hands. So I want to ask you to lay hands on somebody and bless them to receive the impartations. Pray for 